Right. Um, I know uh, almost everybody in this room, but uh, in case uh, I know somebody doesn't know me, I, my name is Zbyszek. Uh, I work in Red Hat in the Plumpers team on SystemD, and uh, I'll be talking about well stuff that happened in, in the last year. Um, I uh, submitted a version of this talk uh, for, for DevConf uh, like a, a month and a half ago. And I gave the talk. I think it wasn't terrible, but I also uh, didn't get much feedback from the audience. Uh, and uh, I asked somebody uh, uh, from, from, from our team, Lukas Schnecken, I don't know, probably you know him too. Uh, and he said, that well, it was it was a good talk, but uh, maybe like if you're doing large scale infrastructure, uh, and uh, because I was talking about immutable images and PCRs and signatures and uh, stuff uh, and verification and stuff like that, uh, and if you're an individual contributor, um, this is not terribly useful. So. Uh, I mean, there, there, there are usually uh, second chances in life, but I guess in, in conference talks you, you do get a second chance every once in a while. So this time I will try to do better and focus on like end user features in, in systemd. So uh, yeah, like if you, if you care about the large scale stuff, uh, this is not, I, I'll try to stay away from those topics this time. Uh, so. A few days ago, we released systemd254, and uh, we try to do regular releases. Our goal is to, to make six releases a year. We average at 2.5. Uh, so there's still some, some, some room for improvement. Uh, I think we, like, compared to, to a, I don't know, five years ago, we increased the quality quite a bit. We do go for a bunch of RC releases, so we, we uh, kind of copy the the, the kernel workflow. Uh, we make an RC, and when the RC is made, we stop release uh, accepting uh, major features and well features in general. We, we try to fix bugs until uh, any known regressions in the last release have been removed. Um, and this means that the, between the, the first RC uh, and the, the final release, we block. Uh, and sometimes this takes quite a while. Um, occasionally, we'll just revert things if, if, we, if we cannot fix them. Uh, so 254 had uh, three RCs. Um, uh, and um, we plan to do another release this year. Uh, another thing that has been, uh, I think, improving the quality and the cross-distro collaboration is point releases. So as, to, as soon as uh, a, any given version is released, we create a stable branch for it and start pulling it in backports of commits. Um, and uh, I think we are at like 251.18 right now. Um, and uh, every year we make more of those uh, point releases. Uh, we have made uh, 29 in 2023 so far. Uh, and if we keep, keep up this, this pace, there will be like 50 this year, rounding up. Um, but um, most distros have switched to building from uh, stable releases. The stable, stable releases started out as the patch set that was used in Fedora, and then we added um, tags to it and uh, uh, I mean, it's, I think it's good that, that other districts are reusing this work and actually um, well, contributing to it now. Uh, and uh, the number of open issues in, in GitHub, uh, which is used by systemd upstream, is uh, growing, well, 10% per year or, well, 12% per year. It's uh, uh, quite a bit, um, but it's also not terrible. I mean, as, I think that as long as the project is alive, this number will have to grow. There's just no way that we will be able to, to close more issues that are opened. Um, but in Fedora, this has happened. I think this is pretty nice. So um, 
a bunch of people made an effort to clean up the queue in Fedora. Uh, David Tardon, Yu Watanabe, uh, and other people worked on, on just going through the bugs, closing out some. So like approximately over the last year, we have removed, uh, well, closed half of the bugs in, in Fedora. Um, and uh, especially like the RFEs where they resolved or moved upstream. Um, I think, well, I, th I think that's good. Um, so let me talk about some specific features. So uh, systemd is big on synchronous operations. You request a service to be started. Systemd wants to know when the service has started um, bringing itself up and wants to know when, the, when it's actually ready to, to serve requests. Uh, and things have been like this uh, since the beginning. Uh, and the easiest, nicest way to implement this is with type equals notify. I mean, there are other protocols, but uh, uh, if you, um, issuing of notifications using the SD notify library or the systemd notify um, helper, from, from shell scripts, or re-implementing the whole thing in your own uh, code if you, if you want to. It's trivial because it's just a, a text string that is sent over a socket. And this works nicely. Mm. We made it slightly easier to use from shell scripts in, in the latest release because there's a new uh, exec uh, option so that notify uh, send a notification and then exec something, which means that um, like if you're doing it from a shell script, it's a bit easier. But one gap that we had was reloads. So it is traditional for Unix daemons to do a reload after getting a SIG hub signal or another signal, but this is asynchronous. And if you wanted to do it the right way, you, you actually couldn't use a signal because there would be no notification uh, going the other way. Uh, so the recommended way was to, to implement your own binary and make it send a signal, I mean, communicate with the daemon, do a reload and, and communicate back. And this was very annoying. And we figured out uh, just that it's actually quite easy to do it properly by uh, uh, sending a signal uh, and then having the, uh, the binary send a notification the other way. The problem is that this cannot be introduced in a backwards compatible fashion by default because actually the daemon needs to send the notification back. So there's a new type equals a new type called notify reload. And systemd will send the sync hub on its own, but the, the daemon needs to send back a notification and now we have the synchronous reloads. Um, so in general, uh, for backwards compatibility, all the types that have been there for services are still there, but like the, the recommended ways to do things have changed. So um, for services which don't have a, a startup phase but just are ready when they are started, don't use type simple, use type exec. So the difference is with type simple, systemd forks, and then one of the children does an exec, uh, but then, uh, as soon as the fork happens, systemd considers the service to be started. Uh, in hindsight, this is not very useful because executing of the, of the binary might fail. Uh, and now in type exec, uh, this, the, the point of readiness is not the fork, but the, the exec that happens in the child. Uh, this is much more useful. Uh, if you use type forking, as, uh, which follows the traditional Unix protocol that you, that you do a, a fork uh, and then another fork to, to detach from the parent. With systemd, this is all useless. Just uh, do, don't do any forking uh, or executing. Uh, use uh, type equals notify or type equals dbus. So if you have a dbus service, then the point of readiness is where the um, child acquires the dbus name. So this is the type, type equals dbus, or when it sends a notification, type equals notify. Or actually, you can do one better and switch over to type uh, uh, notify reload, because uh, I mean, if your service supports reloads, um, uh, and type one shot is 
well, still okay. Um, another uh, kind of useful but not very well known thing is type, uh, uh, not type, a dependency called upholds. So we have once dependencies where you start a service and this service pulls in a bunch of uh, stuff that is needed for it to function, but this happens once at start, and then if those dependencies die, crash, or you know, are stopped, uh, then the wants or requires dependencies have no effect. Uh, and upholds is a, like a, a variant of this, uh, which is uh, mm, effective for the lifetime of the upholding service, and the dependency will be restarted. So, so a classical example is where you have a a container, a machine that has an, uh, I don't know, Apache HTTP D service, which also requires a database to, to actually provide any answers. And one is not useful without the other. So you make um, the top level service uh, have upholds dependencies on all the, um, all the other ones that are necessary for it to function. And then, well, systemd will make its best to restart the children, uh, the dependencies uh, as long as they are needed. And now it's easier to do this. There's a new dot upholds directory. There's always like you have dot wants and dot, dot requires and dot upholds. And you can uh, create those symlinks in those directories at install time using the upheld by um, directive. Uh, and uh, there is a bunch of new unit settings. So, uh, Open file uh, is a, a just a kind of a convenience uh, thing where system will open a, 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 an arbitrary file for input or output. I mean, in read mode or write mode from a service. And uh, the nice thing is that this allows the service to be less privileged. So you can I don't know like if the service needs to read a certificate from a file, for example, or whatever, or write to, to a, a, a file in, uh, in the file system somewhere. Um, we can make the service less, less privileged, have, this, have the manager open the file for the service, and then the, the service just uh, gets a, a socket, uh, not a socket, a file descriptor. And this uses the same protocol uh, that, um, socket activation uses. So, so you get a file descriptor and the file descriptor and a variable that describes the file descriptor gives it a name and then you can figure out what the file descriptor is for. Uh, another kind of convenience thing is delegate subgroup. So the kernel requires that uh, if you have a, a C group uh, hierarchy, uh, the, the process and, and part of this uh, hierarchy is managed by, uh, mm, it is delegated to a unit and there is a process that does the management. It cannot live in the, like in the, uh, at the top of the sub hierarchy because the kernel does not allow um, uh, processes to be in non-leaf C groups. So the process would have to uh, create a sub hierarchy, move itself and then do the management. This was, I mean, a bit of extra work that is not necessary. So uh, with delegate subgroup, uh, systemd will do this initial setup and move the, the process into the right subgroup. Um, and another thing that is kind of touching on the stuff that I wasn't supposed to talk about, so extension directories. Uh, you can give a list of directories that will be used as uh, uh, overlays on the uh, host file system for the service. Uh, so by specifying, uh, just giving a, a name of a directory here with a bunch of files in it, you uh, can populate the, um, the file system that is seen by the service. I mean, it's nice for, well, extending things. Uh, there are other ways to do it, but this one is like very, very convenient. Uh, and, uh, in general, if like for, for the various, well, not, not those settings that I'm talking about here, but for uh, security-related setting and sandbox-related settings, there's uh, always good to use systemd analyze security uh, in case you, you haven't seen how this works. Systemd analyze security and the service name. Yeah, sorry for this. Is this clear? Large enough? 
Uh, maybe I should do it like this. So this gives a list of settings, names, uh, and it's adding uh, apples and oranges and um, cherries uh, by giving some numerical score. And um, at the end, it says that the surface is unsafe, usually. Uh, uh, it shouldn't be taken too seriously. Uh, and of course, the service could be perfectly safe. It's the unsafe means that it's not using the systemd features that systemd well, wants to advertise here. Uh, but this list is very useful to, to think about different ways to sandbox a service and to, I mean, just a, it works as a checklist and a, and a, a source of hints. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's, this has been around for a few years, but still most units um, don't use it, and it would be really good if people were putting more, more sandboxing into the system. I mean, the kernel provides nice sandboxing features, and we should make use of them. Uh, another feature that is new is soft reboot, uh, and I wanted to make a demo uh, of this, so I have a... Uh, I have a, can I turn this off somehow? Does this work? Let's see. Uh, I have a virtual machine here, uh, and I do a soft reboot. So uh, with soft reboot, systemd has three levels of um, restarting the machine. You have the traditional uh, mode where uh, system D shutdowns all the services um, and reboots goes through the through the firmware and the bootloader and the, and the new kernel. We have kexec where we load the new kernel into memory and tell the uh, the and the kernel uh, well system D shuts down all the services and then tells the kernel to execute into the, the new kernel and the new kernel starts a new system D and new set of processes and we have now soft reboot. Um, which works in this way that we skip all those extra steps. Systemd shuts down the whole user space, executes itself, and starts up the, the user space again. Um, so if I do this, um, well, it's restarted. And the main benefit is speed, essentially, right? I mean, it, it, this is for the cases where you just don't need a full reboot. Uh, and... Uh, I wanted to show that uh, if we look at the uh, list of processes, and I will do this not very nice way of re just looking looking at uh, what I do wrong. Now. Yeah. If I want everything that is, does not have a bracket, does this work? Ah. Uh, no, it does. Uh. I think you mean drag dash capital E or extend the right guys. Ah. I, I, I tried this before. Grab does not. Ah. <laughs> Please help me. I want to have everything that does not match a bracket. Grab minus V. Bracket. This should work, no? Ah, okay. So I have process one and a bunch of other processes. Uh, and if I do um, soft reboot, where did it go? Um, if I do the same thing again, 
I mean, one is still there, but I get a whole, whole new set. I, sorry, I, I wanted to show this. I thought it would be, would be cool. Um, because this also answers the question that people sometimes have, like what gets to survive? And actually, pretty much everything goes away. Uh, uh, this process itself is uh, re-executed, so it's running new code. Uh, so this is also essentially replaced, just the number stays. Uh, okay, and uh, there's also a bunch of like helper thingies. So uh, system CTL, list paths, does what the name suggests, list path units. Um, we have the same one for auto mounts. Uh, it's just a convenience thing. Uh, actually, there's a, a bunch of those. Um, uh, they, I mean, they get added every a year or two. Um, and they just list the specific unit types in a nice way. Uh, and uh, I was talking about uh, uh, reboots, right? I mean, the, the, the proper way to, uh, uh, not reboots, uh, reloads of services and uh, restarts of services. Uh, the nicest way to do restarts is when you don't close the file descriptors so that uh, any service that connects to the um, uh, sockets or uh, uh, pipes that your service has open uh, does not get a, um, a refusal, but it's just delayed a bit while the service is restarting. And um, we have the notification protocol for it, right? You, you call SD notify and you attach a socket to, to, the, to the notification and you tell systemd to keep the socket for you while you are uh, restarting. Uh, and sometimes it can be a bit hard to figure out what is going on, uh, like which sockets are which. Uh, so there's a new thing called uh, systemd analyze FD store. And again, I will do a, a demo. Um, I will do it on the laptop because uh, stmd uh, I want to have a nice example. Ah, it requires privileges because uh, I don't know like if, if you were able to, to look at the service and see what file descriptors are stored, this would probably um, possibly uh, give away too much information, so it's a privileged operation. Um, and this is an example for login D. And uh, you can see that, well, we have all the file descriptors, uh, but they also have names, uh, so that it's easier to figure out uh, for the service uh, what those file descriptors are doing, uh, what, what, what they're for. Um, uh, and there is a bunch of settings related to this. So uh, file descriptor store preserve uh, allows uh, file descriptors to uh, not be uh, cleaned up immediately by systemd when the service stops. So you can have uh, like a semi-permanent thing that, that is uh, kept by systemd. Um, and this, of course, creates the problem that uh, if, I mean, sometimes you want to get rid of the, of the file descriptor uh, and, well, there is now a, a command system CTL clean to, to, to get rid of those file descriptors that survive the uh, uh, process, go the, the service going away. And uh, SD Notify has uh, additional switches to send file descriptors with a name. Uh, I messed up the rendering here. Of course, this should be a double dash. Um, and another debugging feature is systemd analyze malloc. Uh, so again, systemd analyze. Yeah, it also requires privileges. Uh, so this this is this works over Dbus. It sends a, a request uh, to, uh, to to a service. Uh, get malloc info, uh, and uh, well, it requires privileges. And what what this this is just a um, a, a dump from a from from a function provided by glibc to to get information about uh, allocations. And uh, well, the idea is that various services will implement this protocol, 
and allow you to well see what they're using memory for uh, and uh, so on. So, uh, I mean, this this was for the system manager and for the user manager. There is some some well different answer. Um, a bunch of systemd services implement the protocol now. Not not all. Um, I know it can be useful. Uh, another one is UDEV Adam Verify. Um, so again, a demo. Uh, uh, when we uh, um, added this, uh, so this was uh, uh, this was implemented in this release, and when when it was added, we found a bunch of uh, bugs in our own uh, well bugs buglets. I don't know how how, how serious they sh they should be. Uh, uh, in our own rules, and we fix them all. So th those are the ones from the distro that uh, uh, remain, and it's like, uh, I don't know, like white space issues. So, I mean, like uh, tokens that are run together. Uh, then there is NFS that does some very strange thing because it creates a package file that is not re world uh, readable, uh, which is a violation of the packaging guidelines. Uh, and then there is some like uh, minor other things. Um, we should probably get some kind of like an RPM lint script for this, but I don't know, I think it would be nice. Uh, and of course, uh, this also finds more serious issues like um, syntax that is actually, that, that, that seems to be doing something, but is actually not useful, for example, invalid option names and, and so on. Uh, and another uh, like uh, thing for, for, for uh, to make the um, use of system denicer is more edit verbs. So we had system CTL cut and uh, system CTL edit uh, on unit files for, for a few years. Um, and now we have the same for machine CTL and net network CTL. So uh, machine CTL uh, is, uh, the, the configuration files are for nspawn. So if you don't use nspawn, this is not useful for you. Uh, Network CTL is for uh, network D, net dev, and network files, but also for link files, which are used by uh, UDEV. So this is this is a bit confusing, uh, and um, another thing that has been uh, that has been changed. Let me try this. Uh, the network. Can I do? Uh, Edit Does this work? Uh, I don't I wanted to uh, I wanted to show that um, well, let me try this. Uh, so now I'm editing a unit file, and uh, uh, this this is this is not very. I mean, this, this has been around for a while, but we keep improving it. So basically, you get an editor that creates an override file. So the the the. Uh, the the file, is, the file name is, well, I mean, without the temporary prefix, is here. Uh, but to make it easier, you see the, the preview of the existing contents. Uh, and also, if you, the, ed, the um, uh, cursor is opened automatically in the right place where, where, where you would edit things. So I don't know, like, I add something and uh, I override something important, uh, and well. So editing requires privileges, but uh, of course, dumping of the file does not require privileges. Um, and uh, I don't know, like in related, uh, also I don't know. This is also a symlink, uh, so I can click on this and get it this opened in a, in an editor. Uh, Okay, so uh, cut and edit for more files. Uh, and uh, 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 like another 
new feature or a group of features is uh, support for um, better uh, booting or better not booting of a machine when the power is low. So basically, the idea is that uh, when uh, we are in the initRD and before we have mounted file systems and before there is a potential to, uh, to have the file systems mounted and data lost, we will do a check. So there is a, a system DAC power uh, implements a, a check of the battery that, um, uh, I mean, dash dash low is checks that it's below 5%. Uh, or more precisely, it checks that the system is running, has at least one battery that is discharging and, this, uh, and no batteries are above uh, uh, 5%. So uh, getting the check right took like, I don't know, 25 iterations, but I think we are there. Uh, because there's, there, you have batteries, you have batteries for which the kernel doesn't know the, the charge level, you have batteries which are there but are not discharging, and you have systems with no power supply, and so on, so on, so on. Um, and there's a new systemd battery check um, um, uh, program that runs in the interd. It checks the battery. It, if it's below 5%, it says your battery is below 5%, plug in a charger, and if you don't do it in if some very small amount of time it shuts on the machine. So uh, we will see, I mean, how it works in practice, but the idea is that uh, this is better than booting the system and then dying uh, very soon after. It can be disabled on the, on the kernel command line. Uh, and uh, there's also a new way that we handle hibernation because um, the problem with hibernation is that uh, um, I mean, it's easy to, you, you pick a swap partition, you write the memory contents to it, and you, the machine shuts off. But uh, figuring out when you boot from which uh, of the swap partitions to, uh, uh, to read the state can be complicated. And also people use swap files. And then, uh, uh, I mean, with partitions it's easier, with swap files it's even more complicated. So the traditional way was to put this information on the kernel command line, but this, um, well, this can be out of date, uh, and then it becomes messy. So the new idea is to write information about the, uh, where, uh, um, which swap file or swap partition was used to, the, to an FE variable. Um, so systemd uh, sleep creates a, a, a hibernate location variable that describes the, um, uh, the ID of the, of the device, of the, of the partition, and an offset and some additional details. And then when, it's boot, when systemd is booting up, it will look for this, uh, for this variable and use this to, uh, well, resume from hibernation. Hopefully this will, this will fix the problem for people who have, uh, uh, well, I mean, for, for whom the, the, the previous approach didn't work. Uh, and, Uh, I think I have some more time, so uh, um, the last kind of thing or group of things I want to talk about is systemd repart. So uh, this is a, 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 um, a screenshot from systemd repart running on, on, uh, on some machine. And uh, systemd repart is a partitioning tool that uh, works in this way that there's a bunch of config files uh, that specify what partitions are expected. It goes through, through the config files, takes a config file, looks for, for the given partition. If it's there uh, uh, and it has the right size and, and so on, then nothing happens. Uh, if um, it's not there, it will be created or mar marked, marked to be created. Uh, and if it's there but it's, for example, too small, uh, it will be enlarged and, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, so uh, Repart is um, pretty nice and a lot of work has gone into it in, the, in this release. Uh, so uh, it has the following features. So the partitions are created in an atomic way, which means that uh, uh, first Repart opens the, the block device uh, uses a loopback device to, to get access to, a, to, a, to where a partition will be, writes the contents of that partition, 
uh, or more, more than one. And at the very end, after everything has been written, it creates the a partition table or adjusts the partition table. So either you get a partition with the file system or you don't. And also, it knows how to uh, create partitions with a file system with contents. So uh, knows uh, in the sense that um, it just invokes the uh, file system creation tools with, uh, in a mode where they write files to the, um, to the file system that is being created. Uh, this, this needs to be supported by various uh, file system creation tools, but the, like, the major ones do this. Um, and this is very nice because, well, you get an atomic creation of a file system that is already populated. Uh, and the new part is that the uh, system DRE part now doesn't require privileges. So before, uh, it used the, um, the kernel loopback device to, to get access to the right place in the, in the file. Uh, and... Um, but this has the problem that if you are fully unprivileged or you're running in a container, this is not uh, available. Uh, and now it has been, well, fixed, changed to, uh, to not use a loopback device. Uh, and uh, it has like support, I'm, I'm primarily, uh, in principle it supports any file system, but the, the ones that, are, for example, allow writing contents when the file system is created work better. It has also support for, for DM Verity uh, and, um, and so on. Uh, and well, it's fast and uh, it's important. So basically the idea is that it it's, runs on every, like, on every boot on a, um, and normally it doesn't do anything, but you can add in additional uh, drop-ins and it will create partitions. Uh, it supports minimization of the um, uh, of the file system that is being created, which is important if you're creating a file system images. And um, uh, uh, another thing that, that is new is that uh, it works, uh, a lot of work has been put into systemd repart and other systemd tools to support uh, operating on a, a change or directory from the outside. Uh, this is... Um, I mean, some of them did support that already, but not all, and I think that now pretty much all support. Uh, and this means that uh, system DRE part can be, uh, is used for the next iteration of MKSI. So MKSI is like the system D uh, image creation tool. It started out as a, as a, uh, as a tool to test system D in, in, in VMs, uh, but, well, has grown into quite a useful thing. Uh, so it has like a declarative configuration that lists a set of packages. And uh, because we added complexity to, to other things, so for example to repart, uh, we were able to make MKSI simpler. So basically um, MKSI had this whole understanding of partitions and how to create, um, well, which partitions and with which size and so on. And this all has been removed. It now just has a directory where you put in a configuration for a repart. And it will, a repart is called to create the, uh, the partitions. So MKSI creates a temporary di directory, uses DNF to, uh, uh, or, or some other um, uh, Package manager, it also supports DNF5, in case you're wondering, uh, uh, to, to, to put files into this temporary directory and then tells Repart to uh, take those contents and uh, put them into partitions in an image file. Uh, and this is like, a, I mean, a much different way of doing this than we did before, but I think it's, um, I mean, it has nice advantages. In, in particular, there's like this separation of, of concerns and, and QSI itself is much simpler. So, okay, so it has a declarative configuration like everything in systemd. Uh, it operates on package names uh, and this also means like you can specify anything that DNF will understand. Um, you can, for other distributions, you can specify other specifications. Uh, so, so, I don't know, like versions and uh, package names with, with versions or package names with version bounds. Um, 
And if you want to add stuff to the image, generally the best way is to, to have a skeleton tree that will be just dropped into the right place. Uh, and, well, it uses other systemd tools, so it supports read-only images and signatures and DM verity and so on. Uh, and for, like, for reproducibility, uh, we are still not there with full reproducibility, but at least we are um, making logs and uh, manifests of what is installed into the images. Um, and uh, I mentioned DNF and DNF5, but uh, the nice thing is that MKSI uses, uh, well, can, can support pretty much any distribution that has like just a bunch of uh, packages. So uh, it supports apt, uh, uh, Pacman for Arch, uh, DNF and Zipper for, for RPM based distros, uh, and it also supports uh, Gentoo. Um, so uh, basically, if, for example, on Fedora, if you have Pacman and apt installed, uh, I'm the binaries, you can create um, images of any other distribution without, I mean, just, just it feels like native support. Uh, it's, this is very nice. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this whole rework has uh, required a huge compact break between the last release, which is like, I know, a year and a half old at this point, and the, the upcoming version. Uh, and since we are, I mean, we are doing so many changes that we, that we broke compatibility and the, the release is still delayed. Um, one thing is that uh, in the previous version, there were there was like a set of stages and it was kind of fixed. Like you build and then you install and then you test and. Uh, mm, different people wanted different things. So this has been replaced by something called profiles where you, uh, there's just a set of stages and the next stage or next profile can use previous profiles. I mean, the name is a bit, um, it fits some of the use cases, but maybe not the others. Uh, uh, and like, like I mentioned, the, a lot of the heavy lifting have been moved to system theory part. Uh, and this means that MKSI now does, it can create images uh, without any privileges. So this, it works in a container. Uh, it's, it's also faster. Um, and uh, another thing that we are kind of getting rid of is that before there was always this mismatch uh, of what happens of some things that you want to do when you're creating an image, you want to do from the outside, because for example, you want to copy configuration from the host to the, to the, the image that is being created, but other things you want to do inside of the image, because you, you, you want to use tools in the image, and then this also means that you have to you install those tools into the image, and then maybe if the image is supposed to be very small, to remove them afterwards. So this was messy. Uh, and uh, because we have been adding support for operating on a change root directory to all systemd tools, including uh, Repart, um, uh, you can now, uh, I mean, the, the idea is that everything you do in MKSI, like all the, all the build stages are invoked on the host, and if they want to, they will just uh, use the change root-like operation to uh, mm, switch into the uh, temporary file system. Uh, but in general, the idea is that tools implement support for you operating on a change root directory themselves, and then this, this means that the uh, whole thing can be simplified uh, because you don't need to have anything installed in the image that you are creating that you, that you don't need there. Uh, and, well, you know, that's what I have. Um, and as always, as every project, we are looking for contributors. Uh, MKSI is in Python, so it's a, uh, and systemd is in C, so uh, I mean, it's, we have, uh, everybody can get involved if, if they want to. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know, uh, questions, please. I have three questions, but I'll ask first and then pass it on for folks who have it. Right, so um, with the introduction of uh, upholds dependency, there are certain services that uh, use needs to point towards network target. So would you recommend them to use upholds and then add uh, network 
daemon to it, whichever they make use of it, system D, network D, network manager, or would you ask them to still keep using uh, the network target? Uh, so network target generally does not mean that the network is functional. Uh, so it's, uh, there's like a whole wiki page that explains the difference between network target and network online target and so on. Um, I think the answer is that this is, this is quite complicated because uh, for services, we, when you start a service and it's, well, it, it has been started, then you know it's, it's, it's there. But with network, you, it de you depend on external uh, state which you don't control, and no matter what you do on the machine, you might not get network, right? So uh, um, it might make sense to, to use upholds to, to keep the network configuration uh, daemon up, but I'm not, actually not sure how useful that would be because uh, let's say that uh, I'm using, you're using Network Manager and it crashes, you don't lose network, right? You, uh, you, get, you have some DHCP leads and it will probably continue for the next day or two. Mm. So I, the, the answer is I don't know. Uh, it's, it's complicated. Any more questions for anyone else? All right, then I'm gonna go ahead with the second one. So. Um, Back, like five years back, I used to, I wrote the system, the uh, unit to actually mount a partition. And uh, I didn't know that, well, that was not possible. I have to use uh, the FSTAP file for that. But I saw that you mentioned of the list auto mounts uh, command. And I wondered if it's possible now to uh, automatically mount partitions on boot using system D. Sorry, sorry. I, the, the last sentence, I because it, 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 because I heard if it's possible to mount partitions automatically at boot with systemd, that it has always been possible. Uh, why not? Okay. Yeah. So, um, any more questions for anyone else? No. Okay, uh, well, third question comes from me as well. So um, with systemd doing bootloaders uh, with systemd boot and cron with systemd timer and network with systemd network D, virtualization with nspawn, uh, partition management as well, now that you mentioned, um, by, by when we can expect a complete world domination by systemd, you know? Uh, next year. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so with the, with the mounts, um, I mean, maybe we should talk. Uh, maybe you should give an example, uh, like um, later, because I, I maybe the, I, I don't understand the question. I guess. Oh no! Let's say uh, I tried using the normal mount command, but I added it in a system D unit, and that's how I tried doing it. But maybe that's not the proper way of doing it. Oh yes. Uh, well, so part of the answer is that. Uh, mm, so system D had this this problem where it would have a vision of which mounts should be mounted. And then if it, the, the, the reality disagreed with that, it would unmount things, uh, making people very unhappy. Uh, um, we have mostly fixed that, I think. I mean, it, it's much better than it used to be. So basically, a few years ago, if you did this mount uh, command, chances would be that the systemd would actually unmount it soon after. Uh, but now it would probably just let it stay. Um, but uh, I mean, still, the, the recommended way is to use FSTAB. Uh, you can also create a mount unit, but there is really no uh, benefit. It's just more uh, lines. Uh, there's also a new setting, uh, mm, system D mounts extra, I think, on the kernel command line, which allows you to specify an FSTAB-like line with uh, source and destination separated by columns and options and so on. And then th this will get mounted um, uh, like if it was specified in FSTAB. Understood, thank you so much. Well, let's have a big round of applause for the talk. Yeah, thank you.